brief introduction. Um, so welcome to Input. Uh, this is the informal Northwestern political science talk seminar series, and this is our final talk of the quarter. Um, as you know, it's a very special uh, talk today. Uh, we're very honored to welcome Kenneth Janda, Emeritus uh, Professor Payson as well, Professor of Political Science here at Northwestern. And Ken's talk today is titled, A Century of Political Science at Northwestern, What You Didn't Know. <laughs> so this will be uh, a real treat for all of us. Um, just to let you know, today's talk will go a little bit differently than input talks in the past. Uh, Ken will have a talk for about an hour, and then we'll follow with a casual lunch. So lunch will come in around 12 or whenever you're ready. And uh, so please enjoy, uh, please, please uh, stay and enjoy conversation with us. And JL is recording back there, so if anyone on this side has to get up, please be careful because I think there's a cord in the way, and uh, or maybe it's back there. So yeah, the cord's back. Okay, so just be mindful that someone is, is recording. Um, so I'll just very briefly introduce uh, Kenneth Janda. So uh, Ken joined the department in 1961 after receiving his PhD uh, from Indiana University, and he stayed here at Northwestern um, this entire time. And I think we will be hearing about his his entire time here at Northwestern. Um, he started as assistant and associate in full, and now he's emeritus professor. In 1987, he was awarded the Payson S. Wild Chair in Political Science. Um, and uh, as, as you know, Mr. Wild's uh, son, also Payson Wild, is here today. Um, and uh, Payson Wild Sr. was uh, a provost and also a professor in the Political Science Department uh, with a specialty in international relations. Um, so Ken has published um, countless books and articles, especially in uh, the field of American politics and uh, political parties. Um, he uh, published really the, the most comprehensive uh, book on party organizations, um, which has completely driven that field, um, how parties are organized internally, how that affects um, political behavior. And he's also um, done countless work in, in other areas of, uh, of political science, uh, including political behavior and party institutions. So um, please join me in welcoming Ken. Uh, I'll tell you, as I said, I'm overwhelmed. I'm so so uh, uh, thrilled uh, to see so many old friends here and uh, so happy to be able to give this talk. I have no idea how long this is going to last. I'm going to try to keep it to one hour. Uh, and I may have to cut out certain things. I'm not, this is not the kind of talk that you can practice because you go off into versions, and, but I'm going to try to hold that down if I can. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Witness the departmental history. I, as I indicated, I talked about all of this stuff here. Um, I, I guess the major point is now that at 76, I've experienced half the department's life. You know, the century department's going to have its uh, centennial in 2015, 100 years of existence. So I've been a witness to history, but there are other witnesses, Louise Rosenblum I've mentioned here, and Paul and Jane Friesma. Uh, um, who came uh, shortly after we did West and Mark, I mentioned those people. I'm going to try to structure this talk in terms of four different eras, two particular years and two eras. The first one, 1915, build it and they will teach. And 1950s, NU and the Behavioral Revolution. The 1960s, Mad Men, intellectual science. And 1970, NU and the student revolution. So we have two revolutions we're talking about here. First of all, build it and they will teach. You recognize Harris Hall. Some of you don't may not know, actually the, the, the student, current student at the political science department was in Harris Hall. As a matter of fact, Harris Hall was, was built by Norman Waite Harris of Harris Bank. There's no accident that Harris Hall is uh, what it's called, it was on condition that the university create a department of political science. By 1914, there were 38 departments of political science at universities across the country. Our department was split from the history department, which had been founded in 1894. Now, you might reasonably ask, why would the president of Harris Bank make as a condition the establishment of the political science department uh, in order to build this? Well, it so happens 
his son was the first chair. <laughs> so he built the building for his son, and the economics department was uh, housed there, and the history department was also housed in Harris Hall. And until 1973, when we moved here into Scottball, the science department was there. So sometimes we have trouble ha remembering what happened at a particular times. So when I think of a particular student, I say, wait a second, did I see him in the basement <laughs> at uh, Harris Hall? Did I see him over here? And then I know pre-1973 or post-1973. Let's take a look at what the university and the department was like almost 100 years ago. The Evanston campus had 2,500 students. So it wasn't tiny, as you might imagine. There were 1,200 in the College of Liberal Arts. 119 in the graduate school, and there were actually four students in political science at that time when the department was founded. The department had three faculty members. <clears throat> Norman Dwight Harris, of course, <laughs> had the chair uh, in diplomatic history. He wrote on, actually, has quite an interesting, uh, if you go into um, uh, NUCAP and look for Norman Dwight Harris, you'll find he has a number of books on colonization in Africa and slavery in Illinois. And then there's P. Orman Ray. Once again, old, older folks will remember a book called Og and Ray. Og and Ray was the American government book for 40 years, 13 editions. And when I was in graduate school, we talked about teaching the Og and Ray course. Okay. Well, Ray was on the faculty here at Northwestern. He also had a book on political parties in 1917, which really I want to look at. I want to see what they talked about in political parties in 1917. Probably the influence of money and politics, uh, no doubt. <laughs> and there was a guy by the name of Benjamin Wallace who left a couple of years later for Brookings Institution. And there's not much about Wallace, and he hasn't written much, uh, apparently. Uh, <clears throat> um, Kevin Leonard, who is university archivist, and I should have pointed you out, Kevin, uh, Kevin uh, has helped me a lot in doing some of the historical research on this, and he found, he managed to find his first name, uh, which I didn't even have at that point, but he's gone. What did they teach at that time? You know, not really much different from what we might teach now. Of course, in America, introductory government, political parties, uh, municipal government, government of England, and so on. Uh, no statistics, if you will note. Uh, no game theory, but, you know, it's a uh, it looked like a reasonable kind of program. Well, what did the, the department accomplish in the first 35 years? Well, not really very much. <laughs> I think that's, that's the answer. Uh, Northwestern had only three different hits from 1915 to 1949. Norman Harris was for 13 years, retired in 1928. Uh, after him was a guy by the name of Augustus Hatton, Augustus Hatton, and Augustus Hatton must have written something, but I can't find very much of it in Newcap, that's for sure. So he was chair for 12 years, and I don't know anything about him. The other guy, Kenneth Colgrove, interesting person, and I'll have more to say about Kenneth Colgrove. He was a chairman for nine years to 1949. In fact, there were two what I call celebrity professors. I have a little website that has some of this material on here, and I talk about certain celebrity professors. He's one of them. Uh, Kenneth Goldgrove taught from 1919 to 1952, so he's here a long time, but he was only chair to 1949 when he started to get into trouble. Um, first of all, he was very prominent, secretary treasurer of the APSA from 1937 to 1946, and still you will sometimes find some publisher will direct something here to Kenneth Colgrove for the APSA, if you ever find it. <laughs> uh, we used to get things uh, pretty regularly. He also advised MacArthur on the Japanese Constitution. And for those of you who are interested in Japanese politics, you may find out that we have a very rich collection of material on Japanese politics in the pre-war period here. And in fact, when I showed it to somebody from the Japanese conflict, he was actually struck by the fact that we had so much material, which they don't have there because we bombed it all. Uh, <laughs> but we have the original material here. 
And some of you who are in uh, the public law field may remember the case called Colgrove versus Green, 1946. Colgrove versus Green was a very famous case because Kenneth Colgrove sued the governor of the state of Illinois, uh, Governor Green, concerning reapportionment. We had state legislature in which rural areas dominated the legislature. The urban areas had very little representation, and he brought a, a, a court case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in that case declared that reapportionment was a political thicket phrase that it wouldn't go into. Later on, that was overruled uh, by other things. And also, uh, Colgrove, uh, well, I mean, before I go to William and Governor, let me say one thing about it. Colgrove also was um, uh, a bit of a fascist, I suppose that's uh, what you might say. He was a very strong supporter of um, uh, Senator McCarthy, Joe McCarthy at the time and uh, was very outspoken and got a lot of criticism, so he left on a real deep cloud. There are a lot of other stories that go along about Kenneth Colgrove and also the way he tried to run the department and uh, wasn't very happy. William McGovern, outside there's a picture of William McGovern, and there's a little plaque alongside it that tells you something about William McGovern. He was the original Indiana Jones. <coughs> He was a model for it. This is the guy who um, um, served here for about 40 years. He was on the faculty. Um, he was uh, born in China, spoke various languages, uh, uh, well, was a Buddhist monk, and had all sorts of different credentials. And he wrote a book called The Jungle Paths and Inca Ruins and To Lhasan Disguise. And he was a curator at the Field Museum, reported to have a liaison with the Marlena Dietrich, uh, but I won't go into that. Uh, uh, and uh, you can read the plaque outside and tell me what some of the books there is. And the, the Tula Hassan Disguise is a very, very interesting book. It's a real thriller, and I would suggest that you read it. And somebody ought to make a movie out of that book. As a matter of fact, I did send it once to Sharp and Heston, but he didn't uh, pick up on that. <laughs> There's also a website, so you might go to that. When we post this, you can see the website. Uh, there's a lot more there. So anyway, I've had two celebrity professors, but for the most part, I said stagnation. There was little national impact in Northwestern. Few political science PhDs were produced here in the department. And I'm going to be referring from time to time to a couple of books here by Sonnet and Tannenhaus, American Political Scientist and the Development of Political Science, book published in the 60s. They did a lot of research, and they found that there were 10 schools that accounted for 68% of the PhDs from 1926 to 1935. And you might imagine Harvard, Columbia, Harvard, Hopkins, Chicago, okay. But also, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. Those are the three next schools. Um, and you did not make the top 10. Uh, a decade later, top 10 schools accounted for 60% of PhDs, and Harvard, Chicago, Columbia, California, and Wisconsin and Iowa, five and six, Illinois came in there. Uh, once again, not Northwestern. Also, they did a little research on PhDs in what they referred to as the APSA establishment. They had 108 people who had prominent positions within the American Political Science Association. Look and see what they got their training. Many of them were in Europe, or about 10 were in Europe. So they had about 98 uh, PhDs from American universities, and from 1927 to 1940, almost all of them had their PhDs from just 16 schools. And inside, among schools were Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, but not Northwestern. Northwestern was not on the map in this period. Zero. Now, some things happened in the 40s that really sowed the seeds for development in 1950. First of all, 1948, Melville Herskovitz and the program, I want to say a thing about the Program of African Studies. Uh, program of African Studies has a good connection with the Department of Political Science, Richard Joseph knows right now. Uh, but 
At that time, it was huge. The, the political science department really relied on the program of African studies in very key ways for a lot of money for sending students and faculty abroad. It was a very important part of the of political science department. There were Carnegie grants from 1940 to 1951. Two major Carnegie grants were supported, founding the program of African studies at that time and supported it. But really, the Ford grant, 1954 to 1972, that really pumped a lot of money. Not just in the political science, throughout the whole university, in, the, in civil engineering, and certainly in sociology, but in various parts of the university, it was really huge. And if you go through, as, as I did, the the, the uh, report uh, to the Ford Foundation from 1954 to 1972, you're really impressed by the way in which this Ford money permeated the entire university in Northwestern. The political science department uh, benefited a good deal from that. Also in 1949, important change at the top of the university. Now there was a dean at that time, Sim Leland, who was an economist who did what he could uh, to advance the university, but the previous president, the leadership at the top just wasn't very strong. Roscoe Miller, uh, who was a medical doctor, became the president of the university, but did not really have an academic orientation. He was very good at raising money, but this is not, the, the academic was not his field. So he did something brilliant. He hired Payson Wilde. And Payson Wilde was a political scientist at Harvard, is the uh, thesis advisor for John uh, F. Kennedy. And if you go to the special collections, you will find the book, Why England Slept, which is uh, Kennedy's uh, uh, senior thesis. And you will find it uh, inscribed to Payson Wilde uh, in there. And also his credit to Payson Wilde. And, uh, uh, Payson then told me that he then visited uh, Kennedy in the White House afterwards uh, when he was elected. Uh, he raised the quality of the faculty in the next 25 years. And so Northwestern went into a national prominence, and I would say largely through the effort of Payson Wilde, who was dean of faculties until 1969, and then he became provost. <clears throat> and then in 1970. Three, uh, the trustees created the Payson S. Wild Chair to honor him, and from 1973 to 1998, he was Professor Emeritus and taught in the Political Science Department. And I still have some of the graduate, the undergraduate evaluation used that called the CTEC form, and there are a series of categories that you filled out. I have never seen a faculty member get the evaluation to Payson Wild. It's absolutely top. He taught a, a, a small seminar in international relations and got absolutely top marks. And of course, uh, now I, I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say, of course, that I was Pace and Wild Chair for a while, and Jamie Druckmann is uh, holds the holder of the Pace and Wild Chair uh, now. Okay, so that's the founding of the department. Now we're up to the 1950s and the behavioral revolution. Let's take a look at the department enrollment. It grew slowly at this time, the 1954 to 1955. 84 majors in the department, seven first year graduate students, 17 graduate students in residence. Today I did a count on the website. There's 108 names for graduate students in residence right now. Uh, and so it's uh, grown a bit. At that time, however, the faculty had only grown from three to 10. Charles Heineman was chair of the department. Charles Heineman later became the uh, president of the American Political Science Association for a year, uh, 61, 62. And let me just add a little footnote, I'll refer to it later on. I went on the job market in 1961, and Heineman was my mentor, uh, which helped a lot. Uh, he was also ranked, they did in this book, a little thing on the Political Science Hall of Fame. And Heim was ranked 11th greatest uh, political scientist in the post-1945 period. Uh, so, uh, but Heinemann did an enormous part in, in raising the profile of the political science department at Northwestern. 
professors at that time, William McGovern, which we mentioned, Roland Posey, I don't know, remember, I, I, he was on the fact when I came out, but I never met him. Uh, Roland Young, however, we will say something more about him later on. Roland Young um, uh, published a very important book concerning political science. He was also the very first uh, Payson as Wilder Professor of Political Science. Uh, and also for a time being, by the way, he was the uh, acting director of the Program of African Studies uh, when Herskovitz died. Associate professors, George Blankston, you'll find a lot of references to George Blank for one reason, he was chairman of the department four different times. Essentially, he and uh, uh, Richard Snyder rotated. Langston was chair for three years, and Snyder was chair for three years, and Langston was chair for three years, and Snyder was chair for three years. So they kept the department pretty much uh, in good control. But in a, I would say, a benevolent dictatorship. Uh, and Roy McCretis, you will see him in a bit if we get the video to work properly. Roy McCretis will appear as a movie star in a film that George Blank has created on um, the Hazel Revolution at Northwestern. Assistant Professor is David After. Some of you may remember that name, David After. Uh, he was here for a short period of time, and he was also in the film, and you will see him utter some horrible words. You will see him utter the words. You won't hear him because there was no sound at the time, but you will see him utter the words. Uh, now, some of you probably graduate students, current graduate students, wonder what I'm talking about behavioralism. But it may not be a term that you're very familiar with. Because in, way, in some ways, it is an old term. It's a 1950s term for the scientific or quantitative study of politics. I'm not going to go into it anymore than just that. All right? Uh, <clears throat> Summit and Tannenhaus um, uh, talk a lot about this in, in the profile of a discipline in their 1964 book. They have um, um, a, a lot of survey data, and I'm going to be referring a good deal to the survey data that some of the has uh, mentioned, but it, it's full of references to behavioralism. <clears throat> By the mid-1950s, they say, in their second book, behavioralism had arrived. So we're looking at about, you know, like a 15-year period of time in which there's a great deal of controversy. And I won't say that the controversy ended at that point, but uh, they have had a ride. As a matter of fact, in 1961, Robert Dahl, who later became an APSA pre president, wrote uh, uh, an article in the APSR, The Behavioral Approach in Political Science, Epitaph for a Monument to a Successful Protest. And, and what he's in effect saying is that people don't talk about it anymore because people are doing it. That's essentially it. Now, in the 1950s, Northwestern became the prototypic behavioral department. Whatever that means, it was the prototypic department. How did that come to be? Well, <laughs> largely it came out as a result of individuals at Northwestern, pushed, I think, largely by Charles Heinemann, and also by Sim Leland. I've been going through, and I was surprised I read through uh, material that Kevin Warner made available for me, and I read the chairman's report, and Hyman had extraordinarily detailed chairman's reports, which are written, by the way, to the dean. And I wrote chairman report. I never did write the same kind of inside stories to the dean that Hyman wrote. Hyman would say, you know, so-and-so is uh, not really pulling his weight in the department. Uh, you actually write that to the dean, you know, that part of that, the way he thought. And he says, now, also, we're going in the direction, this is one thing that's very interesting. I said, we're following up what you had recommended when you said that you couldn't understand why political science couldn't test out propositions, formulate theory, and test out propositions that you do in economics. He said, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so in 1953, the Carnegie Department, uh, Carnegie Foundation gave the department $90,000. That's a lot of money. And not a lot of money now, but in 1953, it's a lot of money for three years. For conferences, and there were a series of conferences, but there's one conference that was really critical. In 1955, there was a famous conference held here in uh, 
and I believe it was held over in uh, Harris Hall 108, but I'm not really sure about the location. I didn't get the actual location, but we were all over it, Harris Hall, so it probably used that conference hall there. And on political theory and the study of politics. And the papers that were given by heavyweights, as you can see, almost all of these papers were written by people who primarily were political philosophers. Uh, that's not true for Robert McCluskey, uh, but the other one's uh, primarily political philosophers. Uh, but as you see, they came from Yale, Harvard, Columbia, Berkeley, to, to Northwestern for the conference. And there were also heavyweights came here as observers. David Easton from Chicago, uh, Pendleton Harry at SSRC. SSRC was the Social Science Research Council was one of the major funding agencies at that time. And he was president of Everett Kirkpatrick, who was the director of the American Political Science Association, um, and Austin Ranney and, uh, um, and Harry Eckstein, who was rapporteur. It was a very important conference. Uh, in fact, in 1956, the APSR devoted 13 pages to report on this, and um, which I read reread recently, talked on the conflict between the behavioralist and the anti-behavioralist, and how uh, they worked uh, at their to resolve their differences. And this is the last sentence in uh, Eckstein's report that maybe uh, the philosopher and the scientist could somehow get together at some time. In 1958, Roland Young, this is how I came to know Roland Young, I was a uh, undergraduate at this time. No, actually, I just started just started graduate study. But this is sort of the Bible that we were reading at the time. Uh, a series of 22 conference papers on approaches to the study of politics. It was widely read across the, the, the nation. <clears throat> and 50 years later, people still recall this conference. As a matter of fact, I ran across an article in the 2006 APSR political theory question devotes a long paragraph to the particular conference uh, at Northwestern University. And finally, in 1955, George Blankson made a 16 millimeter film methodology, which uh, despite Wes Fogan's uh, protestation, we will watch a little bit of it. Uh, Wes, when he came, he said, oh no, not methodology again. Uh, but we'll see a little bit. Anyway, this is a very interesting film, and I never did talk to George about this. Maybe Louise, you can share something about this at this time. Well, that was act afterwards, but you came afterwards, but you may have gotten some stuff. But in any event, George Bryson was not a full professor at that time. And Roy McCreedus and David Apter were assistant professors, and yet they did this film spoofing this whole movement. And uh, uh, they uh, involved Debbie Blankton, George's wife, as a mythical demon. And they are looking for methodology in Africa. So let's see if we can find it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> transferred 16 millimeter film to VHS and then to DVD and then to uh, QuickTime, so we lost a little bit. We dropped the M. <laughs> That's a, over here on Clark Street. That used to be the administration building. Faculty, that was the, the, the bathroom. Only for men, cards. And within Harris Hall, by the way. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, now you wonder why should they find, this is the influence of the program of African studies and the Ford Foundation money. Uh, because uh, somehow or other they, they conjoin those two and they said um, we're being driven by this emphasis on methodology and all this distortion to go and study in Africa and so somehow or other this got uh, tied together into this, this protest. Um, I'm not going to show you any more of that right now, I just want to whet your appetite. Uh, but uh, you might say, how did George Blankston manage to get sound in a 16 millimeter movie? Well, of course he didn't. Um, at George's retirement, we um, decided to put this together of the VHS and add sound to it. So I added all the sound, and Rich Johnson, who's over at the... Um, in a radio TV film, what I hoped would come here today, he did the mixing and he did some of the uh, preparation, and so he's not here right now. But uh, um, I will return to the very end of the film uh, later on. But uh, that's all right now. So we'll ask you to rest. I'm glad you didn't leave. Uh, okay, so now the 1960s, Mad Men in Political Science. How many people here are familiar with the TV series Mad Men? Can I see your hand? Okay. Well, maybe kind of like half. But. So for those of you who know about the series, you know the direction I'm going. And I'll talk a little bit about the Mad Men culture a little bit later on. But uh, let's go on. First of all, faculty, why Mad Men? They're all men. Who are the 16? Uh, in 1960 to 61, but all men. Uh, the chair was Richard Snyder. Richard Snyder himself was an APSA vice president, ranked 13 in the uh, Hall of Fame, post-1945, and really uh, a brilliant guy who always listened to you. Um, when I said that the, the chairmanship rotated between Blankton and Snyder, you couldn't have two better people for the, for the chairmanship to rotate between. <laughs> Snyder was very, very approachable, very, very intellectual, uh, but he also had a vision of the kind of place that he wanted to build, and so he carried through on that. But uh, it was no problem uh, being an assistant professor in that department whatsoever. Full professors at that time. Uh, some of you may remember the name Scott Greer. We had a graduate student by the name of Scott Greer a little while ago. Uh, grad that graduate student was the son of Scott Greer. Uh, but Scott Greer had a joint appointment in sociology and political science, uh, and was very, and really was a full member of the department. The name that I have there in red is Harold Getzko. Uh, when I came to the department, and he's one of, another one of the celebrity professors. Harold Getzko was a full professor of political science, sociology, and psychology. He also, uh, the only person that I know personally had a book dedicated to him by a Nobel laureate, Herbert Simon, with the book Models of Man, who you may, you may know about, you'll see that are dedicated to Harold Gexco. Uh, and so Harold was uh, terrific, and also recently the June issue, 2011 issue on simulation and gaming, which uh, James Bruckman has a piece, which I have a piece on Harold and mostly by his students. So he was a very important figure in the field of international politics and did computers and did uh, man machine uh, simulation. So he was another celebrity professor. Associate professors, um, R. Barry Farrell, you know about there's some Farrell funds around here that supports this thing and this lecture and that thing, and that comes from uh, Farrell, who uh, was unmarried. Uh, didn't have a car, saved all his money, lived in a little apartment, and when he died, he gave everything to the department. And so that's what's funding these things. And Victor Rosenblum, who was a, on the faculty when I came here, and uh, taught, taught here, you left in 68, is that when you left? When you came back, Louise? Go to Reed. Or where? Oh, but when you went to Reed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was uh, went to president of uh, be president of Reed College for a couple of years, and then realized, hey, you've got to raise a lot of money to be president of the university, and you don't get a chance to do things that are interesting. So he came back to Northwestern, became a professor of uh, 
law school, and um, uh, when he retired, among other things, he had testimonials from Supreme Court justices. So Victor was a very, very special man. Uh, assistant professors, uh, of this I want to single out David Miner, because David Miner was, was chairman of the department, he was ailing already, he was a very, very sick man, when we moved, when he had the vision to leave Harris Hall and take over Scott Hall. Scott Hall was originally offered to the sociology department. And the sociology department said, oh no, I think we'll stay where we are. And those where we are, a couple of buildings down south. And uh, uh, Dave Miner said, no, I think we could do something really nice with this. So we got terrific gigs. Unfortunately, he died before we were able to move in. I was vice chair at the time, so I was acting chair when, when we moved in. But David, the reason we're here right now is, is because of David Miner. We also hired a woman in 1963, and what a woman. Gwendolyn Carter was a very distinguished professor of comparative politics, and uh, she became um, uh, head of the program of African studies. And from 1963 to 1972, 20 PhDs in political science, uh, just in political science that came out of the program of African studies. Uh, for that period. It was an amazing time. And we also had a lot of outstanding African students who didn't get their, their may not have finished their work over here at the time. But um, uh, it was, it was like, I never taught in the program of African studies, but I was very, very impressed uh, by the program. Okay, let's take a look at the rise of reputation. <clears throat> now we're in the 1960s. <clears throat> And by the way, let me say that I'm a, grad, I'm a graduate student at Indiana at this time. I finished, as I said, in 61. You know, you ask, what is the greatest department in the world? I would say more question. In part because my mentor, Charles Heinemann, was at Indiana. You know, he was telling me it was the greatest department in the world, but uh, I also read the book. And I, you know. Now, uh, Samet and Tannenhaus had reported three surveys over 40 years. In 1925, a survey by a guy by the name of Hughes asked um, 19 uh, political scientists who, what, what is the best political, you know, this is the kind of survey they did, 19 prominent people, what is the best department? And you see uh, these 11 schools there. And what's interesting is not what schools, you know, you have Harvard, Chicago, Columbia, you have Princeton, you'd expect that. But look at the schools in the red. Midwestern schools. Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Iowa, but not Northwestern. In 1957, a better survey was done. 25 chairmen of departments were interviewed by Kensington and had rated 15 departments. Even though you extend it out, Northwestern is still not there. Summit and Cannon House in 1963 did a, took a random survey of 431 political scientists from the American Political Science Association list. And in their ranking, now Northwestern is 13th. That's right. You know, from no PhDs in the earlier time period to no visibility whatsoever in terms of the rankings, and suddenly they're 13th. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Tom and Tannen House did a very interesting thing. They took all their surveys and they separated out the people according to though they classified as pro-behavioralist and anti-behavioralist. No department had the kind of differential rating as Northwestern. Pro-behavioralist rated Northwestern fifth, anti-behavioralist rated at 20th. It was a huge difference. So it depends on how you view Northwestern, it depends on whether or not you're pro-behavioralist or anti-behavioralist. Okay, now let's talk about departmental culture in the 1960s. Was uh, uh, this was it? Male faculty, male faculty, remember, wore suits. Why say uh, Everybody on the faculty wore a suit and tie. Everybody did. No question about it. That's that's the way you dress. Uh, <clears throat> We often met at homes for business. So we conduct departmental business at home. 
One of the interesting consequences of this, and I'm not recommending it, but it is a consequence. Because the wives stayed home, and we met at home, and of course they would serve dinner or be responsible for receptions or something, we got a chance to know the kids. So almost everybody on our faculty knew everybody else's kids. And uh, so I just, a few years ago, I supervised a dissertation by, by Tom Miner, who was Dave Miner's son. And I knew Tom Miner was this big. But you, the, the point is that there was, in many ways, a very close knit among the faculty here, because we, we really knew each other. But I'm not necessarily recommending this as a model, but it's a consequence of that. <clears throat> Hard liquor was in, wine was <laughs> Boy, oh boy, wanted to wait. You know, Ann and I come from Indiana, and uh, we didn't drink in Indiana. I mean, occasionally we'd have a beer, and maybe a glass of wine or something. Come here and find out we had to learn how to make martini. And then, <laughs> you know the difference between a gimlet and a Gibson, and uh, whiskey sours. And so when we, people would come over to your house, we had a, a bourbon and scotch. And, Sweet vermouth and dry vermouth and uh, uh, vodka and, and and if you had sherry, Spanish sherry, to be preferred. Uh, that, that's that's really what they're like. And so in Mad Men, when you see these these advertising executives going and pouring all this hard liquor and throwing it, that was what it was like. <laughs> the departmental procedures were informal. Now, we did have department meetings, and occasionally we took votes, but they were really informal in a lot of ways. And I'm going to give you some examples, and you just won't even believe how informal that was. <clears throat> Graduate recruitment in the living room. Usually what would happen, we would go over to somebody's home, and we'd sit down, we'd have to stack of folders, and we'd sit around, and we'd sort of read through them, and we'd sort of decide, okay, okay, this person gets a fellowship, this person gets an assistantship, this person won't be admitted. And then we did that, and we... Yeah, have those. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was usually done in, uh, in the living room. Okay, maybe that's not so bad. Uh, graduate placement by word of mouth. <clears throat> I never applied <clears throat> for a position in the cluster. I was notified by Charles Heineman that I would be going up for a job interview at Northwestern on such and such a day. And uh, I was thrilled, of course, that was just absolutely wonderful, but I had never applied. You know, he'd heard from Snyder, they're looking for the, have an opening here, and so I'd come up there and I'd make my presentation, uh, or I'd, I'd come up for the interview, and so I came up here. And years later, I asked Heinemann, I said, you know, <clears throat> um, most of my colleagues, Henry Tooney, and Tooney and Shaborsky were one of my very good, or Shaborsky and Tooney was one of my very good friends. These guys got multiple job offers. How come I only got one? How come only one person ever um, ever wrote to me? Uh, oh, you got other ones. I never showed them to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that's the way things were done. He wanted me to come here, and you know that was it. But that's the way it was done. <laughs> Faculty hiring without presentations or votes. You won't believe it, but I never made a presentation when I came over here. Charlotte, do you know if Lee made a presentation when he came up? I, I don't remember. You know, we were, we had a congressional fellowship and we were working on the Hill at the time, so that was probably one of the attractions there. Yeah. yeah. But I don't remember. I, I, yeah. I know that you didn't have it because um, the person who, hired, who really made the decision was the head of the department at that time and he told others. But I, um, I also remember that he was his, uh, chairman at Columbia when he was a student, so he knew him very well, and he had his eye on asking him to come and be interviewed, but the interview was very... He met the faculty, but only after the decisions were made. <laughs> now, an interesting thing about this, by the way, um, Lee Anderson and I both interviewed for the same job. There was one job available, and I came up, and Lee came up, the way I understand it, um, Richard Snyder and a couple of other people said, well, you know, really neither of these guys are good enough. 
for the job. But probably together, I don't think we've got a point. So we both were hired. Actually, we're in the same field. It was, uh, it was both in legislative procedure. We had one job in the same field. Or, but that's the way it was done. And there were no votes. I remember a time we would, when I was on the faculty, we had somebody being interviewed for a position. Or, uh, and we met with them. Usually, and once again, how did you meet? Never took a person for dinner at a restaurant. Never did. If somebody came for a job interview, we had a dinner at somebody's home. And that's the way it was done. We had dinner at the home. And, uh, and never going out to a restaurant. Uh, one of the reasons is probably because this is a dry town at that time. <laughs> and so you'd get slosh at some of the at home, and that was fine. And so we did that. Uh, but I remember one time we had a candidate come in for a job. I got a phone call. I'm sitting in my office, and we heard Dick Snyder saying, well, did you get a chance to meet um, uh, Mr. Jones? I said, yeah. I said, what do you think of him? Oh, I think he's good. Okay. So, uh, okay, I put you down to yes. Yeah, that's okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, and then later on, we were told Richard Snyder would call everybody, count all the votes himself, and decide what the outcome was, and he did not not the department who was being hired. That was this. So it was very, very informal. Uh, technology was limited. For example, limited television. Now I want you to imagine, this is for the graduate students. How much more time would you have if you had no television? Not to mention any smartphones or anything, but no television. At that time, when I was a graduate student, there was a television, of course, but nobody had it in your rooms. There was a television in, in a, like a big common area that you could sit down and watch the news or watch a program or something. But basically, you went to your, your room and you had no television, no hi fi, no sound or anything. You only had your books. And so, what you tend to do, you occupied your Right? So that was essentially um, the 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 formation. Secretaries typed using carbon paper. Uh, first of all, secretary is always women, right? Their job was to type. So you have a letter's recommendation, you, you hash it out in some way, give it something like this, make carbon uh, uh, copy. And I will say, once again, I'm not recommending this and we should go in that direction, but there are certain benefits. I defy any of you who write a letter of recommendation now in the future to be able to recall that 50 years from now and to know what you wrote. Whereas here I have a letter that I wrote in 1963 for David Kaufman for admission to graduate school in sociology. I have all my letters of recommendation. You can go and retrieve them. They're on carbon paper. You can get them. I have a filing system that is unparalleled. <laughs> exactly the kind of thing you like in archives. Right? I can't imagine that you're going to be able to. You're going to change computers so many times. You're going to use the format's going to change. You're going to go to flash drives and little bitty things that stick in your ear. <laughs> and you won't be able to get it. <laughs> Dissertations were typed with carbon copies. Okay. Here is a thesis by Ted Becker. Some of you may know Ted Becker. He uh, uh, does work. He's at the University of Hawaii. I pulled it off the shelf here in 1963. Carbon copy. You hire people to type your dissertations according to the number of carbons that were required. It's expensive because your typist had to then, they made a mistake, they had to correct three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, or eight more money. So or the wives did it. Pardon? Why did it? Oh, why did it? Uh, well, uh, you see, I, and I should have married you earlier. I did it, I did it myself. Uh, the 